Zero Foxtrot does not profess to share or promote the opinions and beliefs expressed by show host or guests. The Stay Zero podcast was created to provide a platform for servicemen and women to share their stories. Due to the nature of this podcast, sensitive topics will arise. Conversations about combat, PTSD, drug use, and other such subjects will occur. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to the Stay Zero podcast. It's January 2024. It's our first episode of the new year. Uh, thank you guys for following us so far. I've got John Dornellis here with me today. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming in. And you are an Alaskan spear fisherman. Florida boy that moved to Alaska. He's got sick of the heat. Huh? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Walk me. Living in Alaska though now, now yeah. So did you did you start diving and swimming and and fishing in Florida and then just took the passion up to Alaska? How did yeah, you? yeah. Um, you know, grew up in Florida. My dad taught us how to windsurf when we were like four years old. Nice. So surfing and sailing, generally being in the water, uh, the majority of our life made it pretty easy transition. And um, we would go and visit some family friends in the Bahamas here and there. They would stay on this little sailboat. And so my first experience with spearfishing was watching somebody do it there, uh, probably about nine years old, um, and got a chance to try it out. Um, my aunt was a swimming instructor down there with my grandmother. And so I would watch her go back and forth in the pool, holding her breath and be like, what are you doing? And so she explained to me, this is what holding your breath looks like in the water. And I found out that I really liked the way that felt. So that was my first introduction. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it was super slow progress. And then eventually, um, what going was to school slow and progress. Oh, just, you know, getting a chance to actually go and, and do any kind of real diving where I grew up in Florida, the water's not very clear. Oh, really? Um, and so it was here and there getting to go to the Bahamas was about all that I would do. And then, um, and then I was working up in New York a bit and I started spearfishing up there and then going to college in Hawaii that was, I was very fortunate to have some awesome roommates that loved to dive as well. And so the three of us grew very, very quickly because we had buddies in the water. So that College in Hawaii. Something like that. Yeah. That sounds awesome. It wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't bad. Yeah. I didn't party and I didn't do any of that kind of stuff, but we'd wake up early to go surf or we'd stay up late to go spearfishing. So it's not bad. That's I'm awesome. not going to complain about it. And so how'd you end up in Alaska? Um, a few years ago, we met some some folks. We were sitting behind some folks in church and uh, and didn't recognize them. Just said, hey, where are you guys from? They're like, oh, we're from Homer, Alaska. And I kid you not, the next words out of my mouth were, can we come visit you? And so I think it was about a year and a half after that, um, went out to go uh, visit Homer, took my family out there. And uh, met a guy that took me out spearfishing, and that was when I shot my first, when I saw my first and shot my first halibut, which happened to be 149.8 pounds. Dang. And so it's it's the standing world record right now for spearfishing. No shit. Yeah. What, what do those normally run? Man, on rod and reel, because depth isn't a limiting factor on rod and reel. So okay. a lot of those guys, they'll pull some big ones out. Um, I've heard stories and tall tales about fish that weigh over 600 pounds being pulled up, you know, back in the day. So in theory, a halibut could get absolutely gigantic. Um, I can't even imagine what the fight on a fish like that's got to be. But uh, yeah, they can, they can get large. When did you make that record? Was that your first trip there that you shot? Yeah. That, but that was the record? Yeah. Your first time to Alaska? First, first dive. Uh, first dive of that day, first halibut I'd, that I had ever seen. And at that point, the only shot I'd ever taken on a halibut. And that was... That you're was you're one of those people. I don't know about like that. Like taking my wife deer hunting for the first. There's like, oh, this one's got 14 on its head. Is that a good <laughs> one? <I'm> like, what? <laughs> you better shoot that now. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I... I uh that's I think there awesome. is, I think there is something to be said when, when somebody's not, they, they check their expectations a little bit. Yeah. I think you can call it luck or you can just call it 
putting good vibes out there, man. I yeah. Know. I don't know, but it happened and it was glorious. And that just sunk the hook on going to Alaska and yeah, honestly, man, the world record is is cool. Uh, I, I, you know, if if I shoot a fish that's going to be a record, yeah. I'll I'll submit it. I really don't personally give a crap. They all about, taste the same, right? Yeah, I mean, it's that was eight months of feeding my family. That's wow. freaking incredible, right? Uh, good protein um, that me, and my wife, and my kids can eat. That, that's that's a huge celebration, but. Um, as awesome as the spearfishing was, I think overall the smell of the air was what stuck to me, uh, stuck with me so much was just how fresh the air was, um, the grandeur of everything, the wildlife, and then the people most of all, Hmm. um, really, really just fell in love with the way that people think and behave and rely on each other. Um, you know, there's a, there's a season to harvest, there's a season to hunt, there's a season to calm down and, and change with the seasons. Uh, it's it's a very cool mindset. So that was like 2018, I think was my first visit out there. And then I started captaining boats the following summer. Um, and so it's been, a, it was a few years of captaining uh, for cold water Alaska up there. And then this summer, my wife and I were sitting down Indian style on the ground sorry cross-legged style on the ground didn't mean any offense by native that. american style i, I guess <laughs> just anyway feather. one just foot on feather. one foot on top of the thigh of the other my wife were sitting down my wife and i were sitting down on the dang ground golly i can't believe i even have to be worried about that but <laughs> <laughs> we were just having this talk we were having this talk and we we're it just hit both of us like we're staying this is this is what's right for our family. This is what's right for our kids. So, you know, and until we feel otherwise, that's where we're relocating to for now. I'm not complaining cool. about it. Is that, is that your job up there is to to spearfish and to dive and no, you do pri- some photography too, right? Yeah, yeah. Primarily my job up there um during the spring, summer, and fall season is primarily captaining. So I'll run landing crafts. Um, where we're taking tourists back and forth to go hiking, like water okay. taxi stuff. Yeah, we'll do freight delivery. You know, somebody's building a cabin across Kachemak Bay. Load up the boat, go drop them off. Um, schlepping hunters back and forth here and there, um, and then we do wildlife trips as well. So, like, have you seen that video? Have you seen the video of the sea otter jumping on the back of a boat to escape an orca? Yeah. I filmed that video. Really? Did you know that? No. Oh, that's wild, dude. That's okay. super cool. Did you see the uh, the Aussie Man Reviews version of it? No, does, like, an but I've seen accent? his stuff. It's hilarious. Yeah. Okay. So so he did he did one on that video, but th- that video that's that kind of thing is uncommon, but similar experiences happen out there all the time. So you know, I get to have people on the boat and just go and show them wildlife. Yeah. And you know, you just never know what you're going to see. So there's a tremendous draw to the wildlife side of things for me. And um And you said there was a great white in there chasing it? No, no, an orca. Oh, an orca. Shit. Yeah. Talk about apex predator, dude. No kidding. Yeah. That's one. Do you know much about orca? Like there's to my understanding after watching Blackfin, the, there's no on record attacks of orcas on humans. No. Not in the wild. Not in, w- wild. in the wild. Right? Yeah. If you put them in a fish bowl, they're going to try to kill you. I imagine so. <laughs> as mind. they as they would rightly do so, I imagine. I you know. Have I, you seen that documentary, Blackfin? No. Nah, oh, no. Man, it'll it's, rip your heart out and set it on the table. And yeah, screw you. that. I, it's there's sad. there's enough. I don't feel like watching it, but I imagine, yes, it would yeah. probably eat me up pretty bad. Because yeah. getting to see them in the wild, it's, sure. I mean, it's mind blowing. I was teaching, this summer I was teaching a free diving course and we had them come in. Really? Yeah. And the same day we had, I got to see and swim, orcas came in and humpbacks came in in the same freaking day while I was out there teaching a free diving course. It was do you get nervous nuts. with something the size of a truck in the water with you? I mean, they can kill you by accident. Sure. Right? Like, yeah. They may not attack you, but. Apparently a sperm whale, I've swam with a sperm whale. Apparently a sperm whale can boil you from the inside out with their, the power of their voice. They have such, yeah, apparently. Boil you like a microwave? Like essentially that the sound waves are, 
can be so strong, they could essentially paralyze and like rupture your innards. It's so strong. They Jeez. don't. I mean, it didn't happen to me. Here I am. But yeah. Uh, but to answer your question, man, um, there's obviously a sense of intimidation, but fear, fear, no. That's like good. that, that stays. I I have to check out of that before I get in the water. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Because it's uh. What other kind of predators do you deal with in Alaska specifically? Um, I mean, having an orca come in is a very, very rare experience. The most common ones you're going to see when you're actively diving would be uh, the stellar sea lion up there. Now it's, that's a predator. It's, yeah, it's like a really? freaking 1,500, 2,000 pound swimming brown bear, no, you know? Shit. Yeah, I think calling them sea lion is pretty bogus. They should call them like aqua wolf bear <laughs> <laughs> something like that they're like a big gigantic dogs really they're, yeah they're so freaking cool um those are also intimidating you'll get like all zen doing a dive down my eyes are closed i can distinctly remember this but was doing a, a dive down i was all calm opened my eyes and there's these two massive sea lions that are just coming straight at me full speed and they just like danced around me and they were like barking bubbles and stuff. So I did some backflips underwater and, you know, blew some bubble rings and stuff. And I was like, okay. Like, uh, I don't know I don't what know I said, happening. but they yeah, seem to have got... accepted my... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever this interaction is, yeah. like, I didn't get bit. So that was, wow. that was cool. I, I had some friends that got chased out of the water by him. Are they getting or bit or are they just getting scared at the... Nah. No. I don't, I don't, none, nobody that I know has ever been bitten by one. Okay. So it's mostly I, just curiosity that they're. That's what it seems like. Yeah. I mean, dude, we don't live in Disney world. Right. Right. I, I can't assign and tell you what an animal thinks or feels right. or that kind of stuff. This isn't Disney world. Anthropomorphism is, you know, in yeah. the garbage. Yeah. Swoosh. In the Wasn't garbage. there someone recently who like had their kid eaten by an alligator at Disney world? I don't know. Yeah, it was like last year. Or so year at before. Disney World? Yeah, dude. Yeah, they're like sitting around watching the fireworks and a gator. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah, we're still in Florida. Thanks for yeah. coming. Dude, they're everywhere. So bad. They're everywhere in Florida, man. Yeah, gators, I think gators probably, it's weird, right? You have, you have this animal that functions completely in their lizard brain, like mm. really primeval, old, old, old critter, like a gator. On the one side, which is just, if it's going to bite you, it's going to bite you. They are, you know, versus an orca or a sea lion where you can see vast intelligence yeah. and calculation and emotion and personality in their eyes. Hmm. And I don't know which one of them is more intimidating in that side because it's like... The I dumb mean, brute that just wants to eat or the one that can right. figure out how to break the iceberg you're on so he can <laughs> eat you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna, okay, guys, we're going to, let's go and bring this back. We're going to go and come up with a plan of attack for this guy. Yeah, that's how orcs I've work. seen those videos, man. That's incredible. Dude, so that video I told you about with the otter, mm -hmm. um, if you go back and watch it, there's already a dead skinned otter in his mouth. Yeah. When he comes around the back of the boat. So the dodo interviewed me about that video and I told him the same thing. And I was like, I already know you guys aren't going to put this part of the interview in there. They're like, oh no, you know, our viewers, they like things a little bit more tame and that kind of We're thing. We're Disneyland. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not so much on this podcast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the orca comes around the back of the boat and you can see there's a dead skinned otter in its mouth already. I didn't notice it at first until I saw the video. Somebody else pointed it out to me. And um, that orca was like taunting the otter the other otter oh. that was still alive trying to jump onto my boat in and out like whether he was playing or whether he was just being a jerk i don't know um, did you want to say goodbye uh yeah <laughs> oh, God. Dude, well dude later on he took that same dead skin otter draped it on his nose and pushed it up to one of our boats later on that afternoon he had been hanging on to it all day yeah damn like, vindictive i don't know Playful, I don't know, but not exactly my type of play. Yeah, that's thing. pretty, it's kind of shitty. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty grisly. That's, yeah, that's what that is. But yeah, wow. man, that's uh, incredible. Something so intelligent like that. Mm. That's so that's when they come in, do you, do you get out of the water or are you looking for an opportunity to swim with them? So legally, I mean, legally, there's all sorts of stuff in place to where, you know, you cannot 
molest or approach or I mean, there are serious laws in effect where you can't be actively like chasing after them. You Just can't be orcas messing under with them. eighteen or you no, know, no. Basically, like <laughs> essentially, there's all these there's all these uh, sea mammal acts. Yeah. Um. And so you know you got to be really really careful if one wants to come to you. You know, it's all kind of kosher. You but, can't initiate contact or yeah. interaction. You just have to observe from afar. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you wouldn't want to anyway. The, you don't necessarily want to be altering any kind of animal's behavior if you don't have sure. to, you know. But um, yeah, generally speaking, it was like I was saying, to, to have an orca encounter is very, very rare. Yeah. And the ones that I've heard about are it's just curiosity they come in they look at you and they just keep going okay. you know it's they can they can sense you being in the water they'll come in check you out and then what are some of the close calls that you've had are those usually with sea lions sharks. or sharks yeah sharks okay yeah um most of my close encounters have been sharks is that because you're holding a dead fish while you swim to the top? <laughs> yeah, nice bleeding, <laughs> thrashing dead fish. Like, hey man, this guy's got no, food over here, dude. You know, you know, the wild thing is, is as as time has passed and as I've spent more time in the water, um, you start to feel when the energy is changing in the water. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds like kind of hippy dippy or whatever. You hear the dono dono. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you're like, well, wait. There is no music associated with with sharks. It's just silence. So the uh, the Jaws music, as cool as that would be, yeah, it'd be like the ticking clock in uh, Peter Pan in the Peter Pan's crocodile. Yeah, 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 that'd be hilarious. You just you strap a boombox on the back of them. The silence of it is super eerie. I like to scuba dive as well, and I've only done it once. I was in Roatan, and I did a night dive. And man, I might as well have just been in the middle of the reef spinning in circles because every time I turn around, I just know that there's going to be a shark like right in my face. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm just constantly like looking and trying to catch him before he's right up on me. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen, but like the fear is, it's always there. It's always in the back of my mind. I'm oh, trying to like- Dark in the ocean. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Like, pitch black. Uh-huh. My only odds were there were like 12 other people. So I'm just trying to stay in the middle of the herd. <laughs> just find, yeah, just find the one that's going to be the yeah. best for caloric uh, yeah, output yeah. for energy input. Yes. Find, find yourself a chubby swim buddy. <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. <laughs> I just said it a little less <laughs> offensive. I guess. But it, it was probably one of the best dives I went on because I don't, I guess everything comes out at night. Mm -hmm. Like with a light, it was nothing but eyes everywhere I was shining. Just little eyes of lobsters and uh, cool. you know, shrimps and all the, you know. Oh, the like it was little a fun, feeder shrimp. Oh, the yeah. Line. Yeah. It was a really cool. fun dive. Dude, I'm um, sorry. I just played tricks right. you with you. I it's apologize. Right. Um, yeah, no, night, night adds a whole other element, man. There's a, uh, it's the fear of the unknown really comes in. You know, yeah, the boogeyman yeah. under the bed type deal. For sure. When it's clear water and you know what's a hundred feet off as opposed to what's right on you, you know that'll get the uh, the the baddies playing in your in your brain for sure. But yeah, I mean sharks. I've had such unbelievably beautiful experiences with sharks. Um, what's a beautiful experience with a shark? Oh man, just having um, not being eaten. Well, that that's usually, you know, the first first part being a positive, yes, I don't want to get eaten. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's it's wild. You, you have, I mean, I've swam with so many species of sharks, thousands and thousands of sharks over the years yeah. I've been in the water with. And it's really only been a few that have been problematic. And those experiences are usually not so beautiful from my opinion, but it's usually when I'm not paying attention right if I'm not, if I'm not attentive enough to their energy changing, their swimming patterns, um, you can feel when they get turned on. You know, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Certain types of sharks, especially reef sharks, they tend to have a little bit less self preservation when they're going for a meal than, let's say, uh, a tiger shark, where they just see something and they just go right at it, nice and slow. They take care of it. They're not going to race another tiger shark to it, generally speaking, um, versus like a reef shark. If, you know, you shoot a fish and there's one reef shark, he starts to act a little bit erratic. And you're like, oh, I'm going to, 
I'm going to see if I can shoot another fish. And then a second shark shows up. Well, now you've got two sharks that are jockeying for position on who's going to potentially get closer to you. And they start making decisions or they just react to the scenario where, hey, if I'm behind that guy, he's getting to the food ahead of me. Like, I don't know if that's what they're thinking, but that's what it seems like to me as the observer. And when you start getting three and four and five fast, erratic sharks, the behavior gets very out of control very fast. It's like throwing a ball at the dog park. Just there you go. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. With it or a T-bone steak. There you go. Try that. You know, Pavlov's dogs. Yeah. Um, Have you ever dealt with one where you felt like he was legit being aggressive towards you and mm -hmm. you needed to get out of the water? Sure. Um, Yeah. uh, Tiger sharks. If you give a tiger shark the opportunity, they'll they'll take an investigatory bite, really? which for us is catastrophic. Sure. Generally speaking, again, like I'm not going to sum up every single tiger shark on the planet as saying that every time, give them enough time and they'll come in for an investigatory bite. But generally speaking, you know, if you're not watching yourself, a nice slow moving tiger shark that you've been swimming with for hours, um, that seems relatively docile you still need to have your head on a swivel and make sure that you're not giving him an opportunity or giving her an opportunity to come in and take a bite. The other day I I had, uh, we were just down in the Bahamas doing a shark dive. um, And, uh, and man, like there was this gorgeous tiger shark and she was just making her moves. She would kind of come in and there was twice where she didn't speed up. She didn't look any more aggressive, but she came right in right to my camera and you know i had to put my hand on her nose and just kind of redirect her and uh not give her the chance to see if i'm worth taking a bite of so that's tiger sharks bull sharks um those are my favorite shark hands down they've got for me they've got the most amount of personality highest testosterone level of any known animal on the planet really yeah yeah And uh, yeah, and they show it sometimes too, but I've had, I've had bull sharks where, you know, you take a bad shot on a fish, the fish is fighting. And if those sharks have been trained by any kind of feeding practice Mm -hmm. or by shooting bad shots on fish, if they, if they eat after you take a shot, they learn that a shot, the sound of a shot very well might mean meal. It changes their behavior. And so you know, I've had bull sharks that have been trained essentially by human interaction um, that have turned on and gone absolutely nuts on me. And then I've had other bull shark experiences where, I mean, this one time I was doing a, I was doing a shark dive down out of Jupiter um, with my buddy, Chris and my buddy, Matt. um, And we had probably 15 to 20 bull sharks in the water with us. You know, you run a bait crate down, it puts a scent in the water. Um, they come in just to investigate, they hang out um, following the scent. And a lot of the time their behavior, they just keep this calm movement um, in the water. And we had this amazing shark dive, mostly up on the surface. And I decided I'm going to knock a dive down deep. I tell my buddy Chris, I'm like, hey, I'm going to do a deep dive. And knocked out this dive down to, I think it was like about 150 feet and I'm laying on the bottom. These bull sharks just spiral down, followed me all the way down to the bottom. I hit the bottom and they're spiraling around on the bottom. Calm as could be. I started swimming back up. They followed me all the way back up and um, then just went about their business. It was like this amazing interaction. And these sharks, which hadn't really been spearfished around um, and they were all there for food and yet i waited and at the very end of the dive there was one big female bull shark that came in she had a cobia kind of following her cobia is a really good type of fish so i grab a spear gun and i'm like feeling it out in the water I'm like okay nothing's acting aggressive her behavior is really calm so i'm gonna go ahead and take this shot i went down i took a good kill shot on this fish got it in her behavior never changed None of the sharks acted crazy. We got the fish on the boat and that was it. I wasn't going to push my luck. And, you know, and I'm not going to say like that I knew for sure that yeah. those sharks were going to behave in that way. But based on, 
on experience, that was my guess. And that's, that's how it turned out. And I'll be the first one to tell you, man. I mean, you know, sharks not, is not my enemy, but it's not my friend either. There's a tremendous amount of respect. And for me, it's an unknowable creature because it's a creature. Yeah. You can see patterns, but don't ever think that you've got them completely figured out. Always treat them with a tremendous amount of respect and knowing this guy's got me outgunned. This female's got me outgunned. This male, this species, this specific shark has got me outgunned and I'm not going to let up my guard, yeah. but I'm also not going to live in panic in the water either. So when you're asking about what a beautiful encounter is with a shark, it's that. It's a sense of, I am inserting myself into their existence here. And when I get to have one come right to me and check me out and we make eye contact and, you know, they go about their business and they make another approach, you know, that could be almost any species. And it's, to have something that has got you so far beat in strength and power and agility in the ability to kill and yet to have a a moment with that animal is mind blowing dude you know why do you think so many people just feel terror like there's a layer of control that you've got to manage cuz sure. you know all the things if not more than most people know and they just freak out mm -hmm. what do you think that is and I, I think it's fear of the unknown, right? You know, this morning we got in the pool and, I, and I'd kind of mentioned this idea that our inner critic, our inner thought stuff, we base a lot of our decisions in the here and now on what our past experience is, mm -hmm. right? Or our past experiences are. So if our, if our understanding of a shark is, you know, an over-dramatized discovery show or Jaws or some shark attack account, if that's our experience with that animal, that's the information that we have to go off. Yeah. So we will create a potential future experience in our own mind that isn't based on reality at all because it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. You know, we uh, suffer more in our imagination than in reality. 100%. Forget who said that. Oh yeah. And we, we yeah. all figured that out this morning. <laughs> sure. <right? laughs> Dude. Yeah. Like our brains are brutal to us. Yeah. So in the same way that a child, because they don't know what's underneath their bed, they insert uh, an illogical potential for what could be there, a monster right. under the bed, a boogeyman in the closet and so on. We do the same thing, yeah. you know? Somebody cuts us off in traffic, we get immediately mad. It's, well, it's probably because we that know what the Nazi. potential is. What's that? He was a Nazi, <laughs> cut me off. Yeah, he was actually driving a Deserves Volkswagen. Deserves to die in this too. moment, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe if he was driving a Panzer or something like that. Yeah, you know, that's fair. That would be an issue. That's fair. For sure, a Nazi driving that Panzer. Yeah, man, this morning was fun. We, uh, for, you know, people listening, we, we met out at the pool. Um, well, I guess first we met out at the pool. Then we got oh, ran boy, away we from go. the pool. <laughs> uh, I won't go into that story too deeply. But... I learned a lot about Zach this morning. <laughs> I learned a lot too. I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't hold your breath when you're swimming. Like that's, that was. Yeah. Backstrokes only, dude. Yeah, I didn't know if that was only. a thing. Uh, but Talk we got ran off of the first place because, I don't know, a guy was afraid of his boss getting upset. Mm -hmm. um, but there we found it. There you go. The boogeyman in the closet. There, there you go. go. Yeah. He's suffered more in his imagination. Uh, I did poke the bear a little bit and he got upset, but. Zach. <laughs> Zach. Definitely poke the bear <laughs> instead of maintaining. I mean, what did the guy use? He even used the word diplomacy. He did. He right. Did. He's, I'm yeah. trying to be diplomatic here. Yeah. And Zach's over there just ruffling feathers. Well, it was ridiculous, but. I agreed. But we found a better spot. We did. Way we went better. over to Barton Springs, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, spring fed. It was probably 68 degrees. I think something they said like that. something like that. And then that. the sun came out. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. It was awesome. It was awesome. But we worked through what you called the wolf walk. Mm -hmm. Describe that and talk to me about what, what it was we were doing and the theory behind that. So wolf walk in, if you were to look at it from the outside, it's nothing new. It's essentially holding your breath in the water, walking on the bottom with a weight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Hawaiians have been using that as a big wave um, hold down training forever. You know, it's uh, mental toughness training is essentially what it is. And that's to like, when you get rolled by a big ass wave, are yeah. you just hold your breath as long as you can till right. the chaos is over? Right. Yeah. But you got to figure if I paddle in really hard for a wave, I'm burning oxygen, my carbon dioxide is going way up. 
And so, you know, we talked about the urge to breathe coming as an onset from a limbic response. The urge to breathe is based on high levels of carbon dioxide. Yeah. We burn oxygen, byproduct is carbon dioxide, right? So the idea of, of any kind of breath hold training, um, especially moving training, is to build a carbon dioxide tolerance. So that's like the general, you know, what you call it. Okay. Um, there's several ways to be able to do this dynamic apnea. You can kick back and forth in the water. Wolf walk is one of those. So wolf walk essentially takes walking on the bottom, which is nothing new, but it, uh, I developed this after, um, some time working in addiction recovery where I started noticing, uh, when I would take these guys on this general mental toughness stuff, training, walking on the bottom. I started noticing that what they would say, I would ask them like, hey, why'd you, why'd you drop a weight that early? Why'd you, why'd you drop a weight? And they would give me some response. And I noticed that what they were telling me in the pool perfectly paralleled the stories they would tell in group therapy session about why they would, what would drive them to relapse. Mm. So I started drawing these, these conclusions. As time went on, did some research, you know, I, I, I was an English background, not a psychology background. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a therapist. But in understanding the parts of the brain that fire at different times, the way they communicate with each other, and then understanding my freediving background as an instructor, um, I realized, oh my gosh, we're the same part of the brain that is hijacked by addiction and compulsive behavior happens to be the part of the brain that's firing when the when the urge to breathe kicks in. So carbon dioxide levels go up, the limbic system or the animal brain or fight or flight center kicks off a response to it called the urge to breathe. The diaphragm and the breathing muscles start to fight us. But what's fascinating is the way the mind works. Um, when limbic thought starts to kick in, it will often disguise itself as logic. Well, the limbic system is not the logical center of our brain. The prefrontal cortex is. That's where we're planning from A to B. We're, we're making goals. It's where our sense of identity and belonging and, and functioning in society comes from. And, um, and I realized that there is a way, in many ways, to be able to wrestle control away from the fight or flight system in our brains and give control to our higher functioning brain. And that's what wolf walk does is essentially we're going down, we're walking on the bottom, the urge to breathe kicks in, we go until we hit a wall and then we talk about it. Um, we do this in, in a few different rounds and each time we're kind of progressing, going to a place where, man, we meet that dark wolf, you know, the, we meet the limbic brain, we meet those past thoughts, we, um, you know, it, it gets nasty in there. As you experienced this morning, the scariest place in the world is our own mind. Yeah. And as time goes on, we start doing little tasks uh, underwater where we start wrestling control away from dark wolf and then feeding our light wolf. And, and really the whole purpose of it is to differentiate between truly logical thoughts and, hey, you know, I am able to function logically and truly forward think here versus dark wolf thought, which is, oh, I need to, I need to save, I need to save, I need to protect my house, right? Dark wolf is like the watchdog. The, the fight or flight brain is essential to our survival. It keeps us alive. Problem is, is when the watchdog starts running the home and the people who live in the home are scared and have no control over the watchdog, that's a problem. That's where we find compulsivities in our life. You know, it's where when somebody experiences even PTSD, trauma, um, it will often result in us self-medicating in one way or another by behavior or by substance or whatever that teaches the dark wolf, oh, man, this drug or this drink or this behavior is a very quick way for me to feel safe, to remove these negative experiences, these scary emotions that I've hated since I was a child and which have been reinforced by traumatic experiences during my life. And so um, as that dark wolf is trying to basically protect the house, if it's overactive, 
it will run the show. And so what we did this morning is, well, first let's friggin' figure out which thoughts are truly logical, which ones aren't. Where is my dark wolf running the show? If it is running the show, how does it show up in thought as well as how does it show up with the resultant emotions? And where do those emotions take me? If sadness is guised by anger and that anger will put me into a place where I feel unsafe, I may react. I might get to a place where I will react with verbal, um, you know, talking badly to your kids or your wife or a friend, you know, flipping somebody off in traffic or getting to a point where you got to turn to the bottle again, whatever it is. Um, what we want to do is, is learn where does, where does this end and where does it actually begin? If I know I don't want to pick up the bottle, well, what the heck gets me there in the first place? If you can discover the types of thoughts that lead you to the emotions that lead you to the compulsive behavior, that's a tremendous amount of power. And so the whole idea of Wolf Walk is to peel apart the duality of our natures and be able to identify where is my animal brain, where is my dark wolf trying to run the show, and what is my light wolf need? Like, who am I truly, and what do I really want in this life? Do I want the dark wolf to be running the show or not? And there's a, a great amount of, of self-control and power that comes from identifying and then making changes uh, that we that we see in the pool or that we see in the water and then we apply in our lives like for me i get done i get done uh, this morning for example i i finished up and i i felt lighter and there's a sense of peace for me that comes when i realize that i don't have to be a victim to my own mind mm. i don't have to be a victim to my dark wolf right so that's kind of the identity you know i i think i I, I, you probably know my brother passed away due to a heroin overdose. Somebody laced his, his stuff with fentanyl. He was clean for seven years essentially and, you know, died of an overdose. And, uh, the heroin might've been what physically killed him. But to me, I just can't shake the thought that, you know, Michael died of becoming a mystery to himself again, mm -hmm. all this work put into recovery is essentially getting to know yourself and knowing when you're in control and when you're not, surrendering control of things that you can't control, and then just making little changes day by day and, and sticking to a regimen to live a clean life. And he reaped a tremendous amount of blessings from being clean. And logically, you would never turn back to the drug that destroyed your life in the first place. That doesn't make logical sense. Well, there is no logic in that. It is. It is illogical in nature, but that's what I'm getting at is when the dark wolf is running the show, when the animal brain is running the show, the logic center isn't making the choices anymore. You know, we become hijacked by our own fight or flight brain. And do you, do you feel like that happening sparked a greater commitment within you? Oh yeah. To keep Absolutely. the reins on your dark wolf? Yeah. Um, I think, I think keeping the reins of my dark wolf in all transparency has come more as a byproduct of me feeling a bit more of a push on helping other people out, you know? Um, after he passed away, my buddy told me I needed to write a book. I started doing that. Um, I, could, I developed Wolf Walk as a methodology. Um, you know, I, I would work with some of the guys out at, out at Fort Bragg and uh, a couple of different places. And, and in me, I mean, you saw how it was. I'm the first one to go mm -hmm. uh, because I need it just like everybody else does. I just did it. I just did Wolf Walk, I think three days ago. And today already tapping into my brain again, I was noticing different things today than even three days ago, because, you know, what's, what's influencing my life today might be different than a few days ago. Right. So my wife mentioned this to me. She, she was, Something had happened and she just told me like, John, you seem a lot more like, uh, what did she say? It was, you seem a lot more just okay when things go wrong or you seem a lot more at, at peace or something. It, she said something along those lines. Um, sorry, babe, for not listening implicitly. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but uh, it was something along those lines. And, and, I, and I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, I guess I'm not as reactive anymore. I, I, I don't think I'm as volatile mm. as I used to be. And I started going back through them like, holy crap. Like Wolf Walk isn't just for everybody else. Like this, me trying to help other people and uh, and being in the water with other people and being the guy that's running through it with everyone else is is I'm noticing changes. I'm noticing that certain things that used to shake me and send me down a downward spiral, they just don't have the same kind of effect. I feel way more in control now. And granted, like, uh, dude, I'm still a mess. You know, <laughs> I got plenty of stuff that that does bother me and I, you know, and I'll, I'll be working through and trying to continually unveil the mystery of self for the rest of my life. But, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely had an in, impact on me, you know? So I think that that's been the byproduct a bit yeah. of trying to help other people out. But um, the fire very much so got lit after my brother passed away. He and I never got a chance to do this together before he died. Really? I was like, yeah, I was I was just starting to see how powerful this could be in helping someone. And I told him, I was like, dude, you gotta come up. You know, I was living in North Carolina at the time. I'm like, dude, I really wanna take you through this. I really wanna take you through this. And our schedules never meshed. Mm. And believe it or not, the weekend that he passed away, he was supposed to be coming up that weekend. We were gonna do Wolf Walk together that weekend. Damn. So, you know talk about a negative motivator <laughs> it's hard not to imagine the what if within that sure yeah yeah i yeah i've had to i have had to do quite a bit of self-check yeah. on that you know they say like there is no right way to grieve well there's just grieving kind of thing there's the guilt they say there's it. seven stages of it mm -hmm. right i'm mm -hmm. sure you're familiar where do you think you are in that I mean, I guess I'd probably be at the acceptance part, but I don't necessarily think you just work from step one through seven and then never go backwards. Yeah, there's definitely regressions you know, for 100 sure. 100%. 100%. Yeah, and I think some days, like I go to a tremendous amount of anger. Yeah. You know, and other days there's like a moment of guilt will pop in or, you know, um, disbelief or yeah, whatever will, will pop in. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's at a place now where, and I'm sure plenty of the listeners on this, most of us have lost significantly. And my guess is that everybody can probably um, relate to the fact that loss and grief is something that you strengthen up to. It's not something that you shirk off. Mm -hmm. It's a weight that's added on that you'll have forever. Mm -hmm. And you're soul gets stronger as a result. And it's very hard, I think, in that growth to not allow yourself to be calloused. Does, does that make sense? Sure. That's I mean, there's hard. a lot of things to do that people do with grief, right? And being calloused is is a very natural one Agreed. to protect yourself from sure. that feeling again. Do you feel like the wolf walk has helped you grieve? Yes. Yeah. Um, I could, I, yeah, I could yeah. see that helping you contain or maintain control over your thought process. Did I, I mentioned this morning about, okay, so this morning I mentioned um, the last month or so has been pretty, pretty rough. I've been helping my parents like close up uh, our windsurfing business in Florida that we've had for, you know, 40 years. Wow. And that was where Michael and I were raised like our whole childhood is there so my parents have been closing up shop and i've been helping you know build and pack up and throw away and sort and through all this windsurfing gear all these sailboats and all sorts of stuff and as i'm going through there i didn't realize how loaded it was going to be you know oh my gosh like i remember when michael and i went sailing on those boards oh there's his harness there's this yeah you know and oh i remember goofing around here and he and i found a whatever in this area so that's just been like this added load tremendous emotional load that's just been nose nose diving into for the last month and then this shark diving trip over this uh this the new year's weekend um you know that my brother was a shark diver he was an underwater videographer he was incredibly talented at it when he got clean dude 
he got a camera in his hands and he blew minds. Like some of the best cinematographers in the world were intimidated by his by his talents. I'm not going to name drop, but like, dude, Michael was doing stuff on breath hold that these guys couldn't do on scuba. And not to mention that his natural reaction and, and ability to mesh with animals in the water, it was uncanny, uncanny. So he, you know, he's seeing the world from, from beautiful eyes and um, having these amazing experiences. And uh, so going on a shark dive in the Bahamas was like, whew. Now I'm there and I'm holding his camera rig. I got rid of all my stuff. I'm holding his camera rig. It's got his name on the back of the, the housing. I'm using his gear. I'm swimming with his favorite animals. And you bet that was emotionally loading. As sure. amazing as it was and as beautiful as it was, I'm hanging out with all people that knew Michael. I'm there in the Bahamas, a common diving ground for him with the animals that he Dude, it was an emotional load. Yeah, yeah. So I was talking to my buddy Chris, and we were just having a bit of a heart to heart one morning before we were going to go out and dive with hammerheads. And uh, I just looked at him like, dude, you and I both need a wolf walk. Go grab your mask. I'm going to go grab mine. We went, found a you know big chunk of limestone, and we went out and we did a wolf walk together. Then my second round, you know, I was able to work through the darkness and really tap in to um, what, and identify what was ailing me. And then when I got to that point, wrestled control back, counted my steps, put the weight down. Essentially I did round three at round two. And uh, I came up and I was talking to Chris and I was like, dude, it just, the feeling was just desperation. I felt desperate. And I've just been so angry and the anger has been like this umbrella emotion covering true desperation. And that has been an umbrella emotion covering a, a, a dense, dense palpable sadness. And, uh, and it hit me and dude, I cried for the first time and I don't even know how long, you know, I think I can count within two hands in the last three years since my brother died, like the most influential person in my life died and, uh, you know, I can count on like two hands the number of times I've been able to off gas that yeah. and cry. And I finally was able to let it out. And dude, I was riding on a high after that because I was able to actually pinpoint like, dude, it's not just, I'm not just angry at the world. Like I feel a sense of desperation because so much is out of my control and I'm diving deep into all these freaking emotional triggers and they're messing me up. I'm trying to show up for my wife and kids and not be a freaking dickhead to them yeah. and then when i tap into the desperation and, and i'm honest with myself it's like oh well shit i'm just the sadness is still there yeah. you know what i mean and so being able to unearth that identify that in a parallel plane instead of having to relive past traumas i'm able, able to tap into that same part of the brain that houses all that identify it, open up about it, talk about it, be honest about it, and then off gas. And after that, man had freaking incredible shark dive. You know, animals came right to me, man. It's pretty sweet. It's like this nice kumbaya moment or That's whatever. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, it really felt like you know, when something terrible happens and, and you're grieving, be from whatever, and, and people say things like, oh, time will heal, just just mm -hmm. give it time, you know, it gets better with time, or it feels like a very inactive strategy. Like, I'm just supposed to wait, and I'll, like, <laughs> forget. Nope. Or, you know, right? And, and But so doing this, it felt super intentional. Uh -huh. It was, right? But where, you know, we all have the little things I, you know, tried to stop dipping or stop drinking or stop doing little things that you know aren't good for you, but you compromise. Maybe you compromise once today and that's a win and maybe you blow off tomorrow and you, you know, you have four drinks or whatever it is that you're struggling with. I felt at the end of that, like facing that, okay, you should quit now. Like, nah, fuck you. 
Mm-hmm. I'm gonna take five more steps, mm-hmm. you know, and then getting getting to that point, and then doing another round. It's like okay, we're w- that that panic, hypoxic feeling that I felt. I'm now at least aware of what that feels like, and mm-hmm. I didn't die. I didn't black out. I didn't drown. So I can push to that point again, and then maybe just a little bit further, and and that helped me work through. And I know we we discussed that I have a very negative uh, self assessment strategy of <laughs> saying shit that the Marine Corps. Yeah, I, yeah, from the back. Come on, bitch. The Quit whip, being a the whip instead of the yeah, carrot. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, when I when I want to put the weight down in my head, she's like, "Fuck you, no, fuck you, don't mm-hmm. don't do it, <laughs> don't be a bitch." Um, and that's probably not the greatest mindset to come at it from, right? For for self motivating or for a long term healthy mindset, but. It did. It felt good to to feel that your body go stop, quit, and take control back, mm-hmm. and say nope, not yet. Yeah, I'm gonna take a few more steps mm-hmm. and take a few more, and then set it down on your terms, mm-hmm. and then stand up and and suck all the air out of the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was fun, man. It was good, and like we said, if they won't let us do it in the pool, I could probably do that on the ground somewhere mm-hmm. and just hold a heavy weight, give myself something to stress under. And then I don't know, crab walk or, or just walk with it just, until you know, just walk. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to do it on land, just wear a dang football helmet. I don't want to see you <laughs> yeah. like, Hey man, Z- Zach doesn't have any front teeth. They decided yeah. to go and do wolf walk. On I his met own. my kettlebell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, that would suck. I decided to do all this driving, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all your fault, John. No, do not ever do this without somebody watching you ever. Yeah. I mean, dude, and I, this is going to be, I'll say this one time in this podcast. If you're not trained and you're not doing a, any free diving activity, if you don't have a properly trained buddy, it is a matter of time yeah. between by the before catastrophe strikes. Like free diving walk itself. Walk through those. Walk through those. Sorry to interrupt. You. No, you're good. Walk through those instinctual responses. Like our is. I hadn't ever heard that before, of of the initial blackout safety mm-hmm. mechanism. Sure. And then the final gasp. I hadn't heard about that before. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, you mentioned the word hypoxia. So hypoxia just basically means low oxygen, yeah. right? We kind of function, let's say here, and let's say that we're late to catch a plane and we got to run, we might drop it down a little bit because we burn a lot of oxygen with our muscles. And then we compensate our breathing, kind of comes back up, right? We we can function in a hypoxic state, mildly hypoxic state and not even really know it. Uh, where we run into problems, especially in the water, is when we get to an inadequate amount of oxygen in our bloodstream. So our brain needs a specific amount of oxygen to be able to perform all of its functions. When that level gets too low, um, a loss of motor control, for example, is just what it sounds like, a loss of motor control. Um, the oxygen level in your brain is too low and you, experiences, you experience syn- uh, synapse misfire and you might get a kick of a leg or your whole body might start seizing. So that's essentially, you know, your car's running out of gas. Um, there's a, a response to uh, severe hypoxia as well. So the loss of motor control is, it's not, a, it's not a survival response. This is just you being too low in oxygen, you know? Um, a blackout on the other hand is a survival response. And much like your computer, if it's running low on battery, you got it unplugged 5% or so, it's gonna, screen's going to go off. It's going to go into sleep mode. That's what it is. So picture the controller guy in your brain's got a big red button that says blackout. And he says, man, we're burning a lot of oxygen. We're getting to that point. I don't want to cause any damage. Bang, blackout. And out you go. Body will go limp or rigid. Uh, Eyesight will cut out. Your breathing muscles will stop fighting you. Um, You experience a laryngospasm in your throat. So your vocal cords will tighten to keep your air spaces protected. Um, and it basically puts you into this sleep mode. Well, your gas gauge or your oxy- oxygen gauge might have slowed down dropping, but it's still ticking down. Eventually the computer will run out of battery power trying to save its core functionality, right? When that hits zero after blackout and no more oxygen, there's another big red button there called terminal gasp. And so if a guy's floating face down, there's nobody in the water, he may still have dry lungs, no brain damage. And 
if his face is still in the water or if his face is up on land, eventually when he reaches 0% oxygen, that terminal gas button gets hit and the body will begin breathing again. And if you're breathing water, you drown, you die. If you breathe air, you live. And a lot of people want to know, well, how long between blackout and terminal gas? Well, it depends on your physical fitness, your age, the temperature of the water. So one guy, he he uh, blacked out in his bathtub. It was like an old, an elderly gentleman in a, in a hot bath in Germany or something. And his wife couldn't get him up, ended up drowning in his own tub. Um, they estimate that his terminal gasp occurred probably about 45 seconds after he blacked out. Hmm. Another story, uh, this kid, he was, I don't know, it was somewhere in Scandinavia, I think, but this kid was walking across a frozen river, broke through the ice and got swept oh. underneath. Yeah, gnarly. Uh, they were trying to find him, uh, couldn't find him. Eventually they found him. They broke through the ice, pulled him up. And when his face felt the air again, he started breathing. He hadn't even had a terminal gasp. No brain damage, no dysfunction. It was like 45 minutes. Wow. Something like that. So young, cold water, good health versus elderly, hot water, terrible health, overweight, that kind of thing. So it it varies on the person and their health and so on. But um, there is a period, what I'm getting at is there is a period of time where you have low oxygen, low enough to trigger the blackout, but not 0%. 0% is basically where the clock starts ticking for brain damage. Yeah. That's like, hey, somebody drowned and their oxygen is burned out zero. That's where people will say like four to six minutes, irreparable brain damage. So that's talking about drowning and 0% oxygen in the brain. The brain is unable to um, basically function at all, right? Um, so there's a big difference between drowning and blackout. A drowning is aspiration of water. It's where water's in the lungs, you can't pull oxygen out of it. And your brain zaps, your muscles zap the oxygen in your existing bloodstream. Once it goes to zero, brain damage occurs if the person doesn't get resuscitated. So when I say, hey, you know, be trained, yeah. take a freaking free diving course, <laughs> know what you're doing for yourself. And then anytime you're gonna be diving and doing anything, make sure your buddy is trained and knows how to protect uh, the person. So, you know, if nothing else, remember this, your job as a safety in free diving is protect the airway of the guy that's in the water that you're supposed to be watching out. Like when they come up, the way that we were doing this, we ran through our training this morning, we went through all the safety stuff. You know, you need to be arms reach distance away from me when I go and do my wolf walk. Mm -hmm. And you need to be watching me and I'm, you're looking for an okay signal and so on and so forth. You know that because you're trained. Yeah. So. You know. Have you ever blacked out? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? What was that like? I, I don't remember the actual blackout at all. I only remember the moments leading up to it and then afterwards. It was uh, during a training session, uh, specifically in a pool controlled environment. Uh, I had my primary safety, then I had a secondary and tertiary safety as well. Um, and I went for my max. And I I got up, I think somewhere around it was cold water and I had been shivering for about a half an hour, mm. which kills your ability to hold your breath. But anyway. Um, I felt that this morning. Like I'm in there shaking. It messes you up, I doesn't like, it? I took a bunch of breaths. Why? Yeah. I'm like holding my breath yeah. for 20 seconds. I'm ready to stand no, up. It, it, it messes you up. But yeah. Yeah. It was, I, I remember my buddy giving me like a, a time. And then I just remember like, like looking around and seeing hands moving my face. And then I remember auditorially, is that a word? Yeah. Anyway, I heard somebody say, I won't sound so I heard on the sound waves. <laughs> yeah, my eardrums were vibrating and I interpreted it as meaning to breathe. But yeah, I, I could hear somebody telling me to breathe and I started breathing again and that's all that I remember. But then somebody showed me the video. Dude, I look like a freaking like zombie. Face wow. was white, lips were blue. I'm looking at everybody. But just no connection. But no connection. Nobody's Completely home. Completely out. Yeah. If, if that in that situation, if if my buddy hadn't been trained and knew what he was doing, you know, I would have been dead. But it's uh, yeah. If you'd have dropped back under the water or something. Sure. Yeah. I mean, your legs are going to buckle. Your body's going to go limp, and down you go. What was the record that you were trying to? What was your PR? Oh man, static. I hate static apneas. It's 
I like moving when I'm doing my breath hold. My longest static is only like five fifteen or something like that. Minutes? Yeah. Yeah. No, dude, I'm I'm telling you, like in the free diving world, I've got buddies that they're really good at just not thinking of anything. I my brain just wanders so much. I have to really be focused on like light moving or something. But when I'm moving or doing depth, I love depth. Yeah. I love moving in the water. So if I'm gonna be doing any kind of, you know, pushing it. I, I like to be able to do it down. They say time the flies when you're having fun, right? So like when so. I'm moving and I'm looking at stuff, I'm not thinking about yeah. the fact that I'm just sitting here holding my breath. Yeah, no, sitting there holding my breath, is there's nothing fun no, about that, that to sucks. me. So <clears throat> for for those of you free divers who like doing statics, good for you. I don't like it. I'll teach other people to do it. And I think there's a tremendous amount of help in, in identifying and learning about yourself doing static apneas. You know, obviously always with a safety buddy. Um, but man, for me personally, I, I could take it or leave it. <laughs> Was that scary for you at all? The blackout? Yeah. No, not no. at all. No. You don't You don't know that it's coming. You will not know that a blackout is coming. I felt pretty uncomfortable in like my final three seconds down there. Like, did you feel that? Were you like, fuck, this is before? Oh, yeah. No, but, but you got to remember that's not your hypoxia that's making you uncomfortable right? That's high levels of carbon dioxide, not low levels of oxygen. Hmm. So your urge to breathe, all that physical discomfort, you know, the tension in the neck, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles fighting against you, dude, that's, that's all urge to breathe, which is not based on low oxygen. It's based on high levels of carbon dioxide. Whatever it's based on. It's not, not <laughs> it very sucks. nice, is it? <laughs> yeah. Dude, luckily we were doing it while we were walking. So you yeah, can at least yeah. focus on like the ground underneath you right. instead of staying still and just hating life, doing nothing. That's my opinion about it anyway. What has been your scariest moment in the water? Ooh. Um, scariest moment. Any moment you felt like you, you went too far? Dude, believe it or that not. That was bad judgment. I, I actually think my scariest moment was probably actually on scuba. Scuba scares the living crap out of me just because it's not a natural thing for somebody to be breathing underwater. It's Free diving weird. is natural. Every time I've yeah. taken my first breath underwater on a scuba dive, it's yeah, weird. It is. I have to yeah, like, we it's were, okay, you can do it. Yeah, no, we weren't <laughs> We weren't meant to do it, <laughs> yeah, right? No, breathing, it's super weird. Yeah, breathing compressed air underwater is a man-made thing. For sure. And so I'm trusting my gear, I'm trusting my timetables, I'm trusting my watch, like I'm trusting that this line that I'm following back to the boat actually goes back to my anchor. Mm. And so there was one time where um, I was down, it was in North Carolina, we were hunting for megalodon teeth, um, about 113 feet of water. And you follow the anchor chain down and then you follow your guideline out to wherever you're hunting for stuff. And then you have to follow your guideline back. You have to be watching your time on the bottom and then making sure that you're getting back so that you're up to a certain point at a specific time so that you're not you know, getting the bends, which is pretty freaking the nasty. The boat moves, right? It's on anchor. So we anchor it off. Why wouldn't you just move the anchor to where you want to search? Oh, that's a big old, it's a big old heavy anchor, man. Burning okay. a bunch. Yeah. Oh, no. so the anchor station. Yeah. It doesn't the, move. The anchor stays still and okay. then we just clip it's on. like a like mooring a ball. Rule. Essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we go out, we'll drop anchor in a specific spot and then we fall it down clip our guideline off to it and then go out yeah. peeling it away so that we can follow our specific line back and, and know this is the way back to the boat. Yeah. So that, you know, if you're surfacing, if there's two knots of current and you've got to do a free ascent mm -hmm. um, or you do an ascent without a guideline or something to hold on to, it's just so easy to get swept off yep. and lost. And yep. anyway, so I was, I was at the end of my dive and, you know, getting tooth fever, like, oh, one more tooth, one more tooth. And, I checked my time. I checked the pressure on my um, my bottle, and realized like, okay, I got to get back. So I start making my way back, and I realized, thank goodness, but I realized about like thirty feet into my trip back to the boat that I was following the wrong line, mm -hmm. and I was going away from the boat. Mm -hmm. And I had to take a moment. I think I checked my compass or something to where I'm like, no, wait, I think the boat's back this way. So I turned back around and followed the line. And the whole time, the visibility wasn't very good. And the entire time back to the anchor, I'm like, please, God, please, God, like, let this be the right place because I don't want to run out of air down here. 
you run out of air at depth and you have to shoot up, yeah. you're going to get narked you're, or yeah. you're going to get bent. And that's a good way to end up paralyzed for the rest of your life. So that feeling of, I made a mistake, this could be a fatal mistake is that to me is is the scariest thing because it's projecting a potential fear onto the future. Again, Absolutely. the boogeyman under the bed. So as far as like fear, it, the fear of now is very different than fear of what may come, right? Um, I, I think the fear of what may come is always gonna be a scarier one because it's less, it's less true and therefore more um i don't There's know no what, limit on your imagination exactly right yeah like yeah versus i mean you know it's like when the crap hits the fan and you're dealing with right here and now stuff is going really really wrong right now yeah dealing with that it's like i go tunnel vision and very focused calm if somebody gets injured help a shark is getting too close and is going to full attack mode respond calm you know versus oh my gosh what if i made this mistake what are the ramifications and creating that story in my mind that is such a deep oh, like oh yeah oh man you know yeah you know what i'm talking about oh, I've, like I've that's scuba dove yeah <laughs> yeah okay if you've, yeah you know what i'm yeah, talking about that's why i don't dive in caves I mean, I've got a buddy in Florida that's on the di the dive team for um, Florida Parks and Wildlife. Oh, so he dives all the spring oh, in yeah. North Florida? Pulling bodies yeah. out of springs. Yep. And so every time I talk to him, there's a story of a diver they found. And Florida's oddly connect, like all the springs are mm -hmm. connected. Dude, you could do like a mile underground. Easily. Yeah, it's amazing. What, or more. Yeah. It's like people popping up in other counties and like a mm -hmm. farmer's, you know, cattle pond guy found like a skylight like <laughs> sweet thank you yeah yeah, that yeah. that's crazy yeah. i didn't know that it's it is nuts um but I, there was a movie about a bunch of kids in thailand i think it was have you seen that oh dude that yeah the i haven't 13... seen it but I, i've heard the story where they were able to get down through and then one kid at a tight yeah it was like a six out. hour dive to get them from where they were to out and they were like children so, yeah, it was. They were in a cave and it flooded, mm -hmm. right? Yep. The cave flooded. They they were like they they finally find them like after a couple of days, and then they come out these professional divers and like yes, we found them. They talk to the mayor and they're like, but there's no there's no. And the mayor goes out and he's like, oh, we found them. We're gonna do everything we can to rescue them. Like guys, in the you press can't conference. Say that. Yeah. There's nothing we can do to save them. And so what they ended up doing. Spoiler alert: If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Um, they bring in a, a medic, that, that's another diver that they knew, and they hit each boy with ketamine. They tie their feet together and their hands behind their back. They put a mask over their face and they strap it to their head and they bump them with ketamine every 30 minutes for six hours while they guide them out like a briefcase. And they so the saved- kids, The kids are out. Completely like out. Cold. out completely out no, no memory freaking way i no didn't know idea. that and they and they did they didn't lose a single kid dude whoever came up with that Bruh. rescue that like someone had to quickly come up with that as a solution well it was props it, it was the only was. one that they had they're like these kids have I, never who dove. The heck comes up with the idea like they, hey there's some kids six six hours underwater I know what we do. Shoot them up with some ketamine, strap a face <laughs> like, How do we get them out? How do I stop a kid that's never dove from panicking? Just how do I, you know, because these guys are professional divers. They've, they're like, there's no way I can teach 13 children. I'll be pulling 13 dead bodies out. Like, what? how do we keep them from freaking out? So they basically put them into stasis, yes. essentially. That is full incredible. anesthesia. Strap I didn't know boom. that dude, part it's of the a story. Great I'm gonna have movie. to watch that movie now. Frick, you got they, me. They lost one person, and it was uh, I think a Thai seal, like a Navy seal from the oh one of the, the rescuers. Local. It right. might have been the Philippines. I can't recall where the islands were, but a local rescuer was the only person that died out of the whole thing. Great dude, movie. Talk great about story. talk about like those guys needing to navigate their own heads. Man. Like the potential for failure and all the stuff noodling on their head and just having to. Because they lo you lose one. Oh, I dude. Mean, yeah. They pulled it all off.
That's wild. It's a cool story. No kidding, man. Golly. What are some of the what's some of the conservation stuff that you do? Do you involved in that at all? Man, I I think at least in Alaska, no, I know really, there's all kinds of I don't know how the fishing world is. Yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking just I think my own mindset and the way that I approach um my underwater hunting and the way that I teach my kids and then just having conversations, you know, it's it's like guerrilla marketing as opposed to being up in everybody's face about it. Um, there's a tremendous amount of power about, you know, paying attention enough to the facts that are out there without letting opinion and other people's ethics mm -hmm. get in the way of you making a logical decision about yeah. it, right? So for me, if I, if I am lined up on a fish and I am willing to commit to take that life and that is gonna come to feed my family. Like, okay, yeah, it's gotta be legal. But just because something was legal doesn't mean that it's personally right for me, Sure. right? And just because something's personally right for me doesn't mean I just go and break the law, right? So putting the external, the external uh, parameters aside, my internal um, compass, I guess, is I've gotta be committed to this animal, otherwise, do you go out specifically looking for a type of fish or do you yeah, depending wing on where it I'm at the reef and like, these things are, these are the legal things we can hunt. Let's mm -hmm. go see what we can find. Yeah. I, I think, I think anytime you, um, you spend enough time in any given spot, you, you get a taste for a specific type of fish and you would love to have that fish. Um, you know, as time goes on a lot of the time. So for example, when I was, I would dive up um, off of Rhode Island and New York quite a bit back in the day. And uh, when I would visit up there over the summer and, um, and I always wanted to shoot the biggest striped bass that I could find. But then as time went on, as I learned about their breeding cycles and realized like, dude, a 25 pound fish has like a fourth of the egg carrying capacity and reproductive and reproductive impact as a 50 pound fish. These 50 pound fish are super readers and they don't taste as good and they don't fight as good as, or fight as well as a 25 pound fish. Hmm. So instead of me shooting the big photo op fish, I made a personal decision not to. Now, legally speaking at the time, you could shoot you know, one fish or two fish up to a certain amount or whatever, but at some point it kind of, my own, um, you know, my own decision to shoot a specific fish changed and the size of that fish changed based on my personal needs and what I was okay with. So for example, when I was in New York, my favorite type of fish to shoot was a striped bass, about the range of 20 to 25 pounds because the meat quality is fantastic, still had a huge meat yield, lower mercury content, and that would be my target fish. So I would go out and, and pick on the map or make choices of where I would go to have the highest chance of success for that. In Alaska, you know, halibut for me is the pinnacle fish. It's the best fight of any fish I've ever had. Um, the halibut and, is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you said better one than of them tuna. almost drowned you, right? Yeah, we'll get to that story here, <laughs> here in a little bit. I'm sure that's gonna come out. But uh, so if I'm hunting halibut, for example, and I know that if I'm targeting halibut, I will inevitably attract black rockfish, for example. I don't need to worry about targeting the black rockfish because those will come as I'm hunting for my halibut. So I focus my efforts on the way that I'm diving and the areas that I'm diving um, to try to narrow in on my targeted species based on the needs of my family, the needs of my friends and the type of fish that I feel like hunting. And then, um, you know, and then I'll have like kind of secondary fish that I'm targeting and so on. Um, and I think that's pretty much any place that I've ever been. You know, if yeah. I, when I was going to Fiji, my, my pinnacle fish there was the dog tooth tuna. Fantastic eating, fantastic fight, um, sustainable, you know, the whole nine yards. Are you spear fishing all of these? Oh, Is yeah. that what you, mm -hmm. that's your jam? Yeah. I'm not a big fan of rod and reel. I think it's, it's apples and oranges for me. Fishing is fishing, spear fishing is hunting. Hmm. It's very similar to bow hunting basically, but you're holding your breath and you're underneath the water. So m many of the same tactics, like you can stalk with a bow, you can lie in wait with a bow, same thing with a spear gun or with a pole spear. So, nice. mm -hmm. 
Talk to me about the training. You've done a lot of training and work with some special forces groups, mm -hmm. kind of teaching them your philosophy. What's that been like? Um, training for myself or training others? You're talking about training, training others? Training them, what it's done for you, what it is sure. that you're teaching them, how it's helping them. Yeah, so essentially, you know, uh, I've taught freediving classes and I've had, I've had participants from unnamed, um, unnamed groups that have, that have joined, you know, that they don't, they don't even want to talk about what group they come from, uh, up close to like Pensacola area and whatnot. But, um, there's the Navy dive fishing. schools down there. There's yeah, a lot of dive schools. Yeah. And then they, there's some, you know, there's some kind of you have the top tier and then you kind of have where the tiers disappear sure you got some of those guys but uh, i had a few of those guys where they show up and they just look like freaking thor of men and they've got old bullet holes and stuff and i'm like holy crap i'm outgunned with these guys but you know they're there to take spearfishing class from me and they're stoked to go they out they can't hold their breath for five minutes so yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh it's gotta wait them out so i've taught some of them i, I taught some seals down in um in California, a spearfishing class, but really for me, the highest, uh, the highest honor in teaching military special forces, the soft community has been teaching wolf walk to guys. Cause you know, I, I've, I've gone and worked with some of the guys out at Fort Bragg, um, uh, at the dive locker out there and getting to take the instructors through, you know, these guys have seen about all there is to see. And, um, and then they're teaching guys to go out and have an effective career um being the tip of the spear right and uh and getting a chance to work with those um those active duty as well as some of their friends that were former duty that uh that would come in and, and join us um you know you hear these guys talk and i remember the first time i went in to spend some time with them in the pool i expected to hear the PTSD from war stories. I expected to hear some trauma that happened overseas. And what was wild was um, so many of the thoughts and the powerful emotions that they would evoke came way more from childhood memories than anything that happened overseas. Mm. And what I realized is like, dude, you know, I'm coming to realize we all, any, experience we have, whether it's at war or any form of life, we view those traumatic experiences through the filter, through the lens of our upbringing, you know? And, you know, one of the guys he, he shared in there about, um, about abuse that had happened in his home. That's what, which that's what showed up in his head. Hmm. And that abuse in the home led him down a specific mental and emotional path. And that lens of experience was what he viewed all of his trauma at war through. And so that PTSD, any PTSD or PTSI that he experienced overseas was very much amplified and, um, and made even more repugnant to his existence because of what happened when he was a kid. And that was very, very common. And these guys, so much of it too, you would have like these past experiences come out, but then you would also hear how those, that way of viewing themselves would come out in just wanting to be a better dad, wanting to be a better husband, be less volatile, you know, feelings of shame over yelling at a kid would show up. And, and again, remember, this is not the logical brain speaking. This is the animal brain, okay? Urge to breathe is kicked in. Animal brain's running the show. Pay attention to the thoughts. What are those thoughts? What are the feelings? What are the emotions that it, that it elicits? So this is not like a logical response. And what that brings up for these guys is not overseas. It's past. Are you as to child. why that would be? Well, I mean... You know, Why, I, when I, you want to breathe, do you think of getting abused as a child? Remember what you were saying about unearthing, right? If if I have an anger problem, I probably have a something else problem. And if I've got a, that problem, I probably got a something else problem. Yeah. Getting down to the nitty gritty and getting to the depths of what is actually getting me to a more protective 
type of emotional um, response is where you start to remove the power of that response. And, and, you know, wolf walk is not therapy. It's not, it's not the heal all it's remove the mystery of self. Right? So if you start like, for example, my experience this, uh, the other day, I realized my anger was the macho umbrella emotion covering my absolute desperation. And that desperation came because my sadness was unpalatable. I couldn't handle how much sadness I went. So I was protecting that and protecting that. You know, anger, they call anger a secondary or an umbrella emotion, right? That's not my terminology. Lots of people call it that. And the reason why they say that is because anger tends to be the protector. That's the macho emotion. You know, we don't ever see somebody in a John Wick movie when his dog dies, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Let's call it what it, it kills is. Like his dog didn't people. die. His dog got freaking murdered yeah. by some douchebags. Anyways, it wasn't like him showing sadness and vulnerability that sold tickets. It was him like becoming stoic and his righteous indignation and just slaughterhouse. That was the punishment, right? And all it took to sell that whole plot to America was to kill a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> We're all like, yeah, <laughs> murder. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. But uh yeah, so we're 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 taught this and it's not just in this culture. It's anger is the is the safe emotion. If I'm angry, no one's going to judge me for it. If I show if I show anger, I must look stronger. And a lot of the time that outward showing of anger and quick reaction to anger is almost always going to be a pretty good indicator that you're being triggered. Hmm. Like my, one of my buddies told me this. He was like, I was like, dude, I just feel so freaking angry right now. Like this thing happened. This guy, this guy said this to me and I just like, it just welled up this deep anger. And my buddy told me, he's a, he's a therapist. And he was like, he was like, you know, John, I have noticed that when your first emotion after a trigger of some kind, something enters in your life, a circumstance shows up. And he said, when anger is the immediate response, it's almost always a trauma response. Hmm. And I was like, shit. All right. Well, what do I do with that? You know? And, and what dude, do you do with freaking, that? I mean, yeah. Like you're having a reaction, mm -hmm. feeling that anger. Maybe it's being triggered by something, but mm -hmm. The dark wolf has learned that anger feels safer, right? Its job is to protect you. Dark wolf is to protect the home. Sounds very similar to like ego with taking psychedelics, hmm. killing the ego. The ego is there to protect you, to tell you that you're, you're good. You don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. You've gone deep enough. You're, you're fine. Mm -hmm. And you have to fight through and kill that ego to find enlightenment or find your peace on the other side or just gain self-control and self-awareness, like you said. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if killing the ego, we still want a watchdog, right? Like it or not, like it or not, we are They're good to have. creatures. <laughs> yeah. They're good to have, yeah. you know, that's its freaking job. Yeah, yeah. But it should only do its job, nothing yeah. more. So if, if anger becomes the safe emotion that is utilized, by our fight or flight brain, mm. um, and it's covering something that is much less safe feeling, most likely that's something that at some point, you know, getting into it and discovering that and working through it, there's a lot of different successful forms of, of therapy and, and, you know, resources to be able to work through that, to tap in, you know, to where you're essentially childhood or adolescent upbringing doesn't have to be the way that your life is dictated and the way that you respond to thing to, to things i really believe you know circumstances don't dictate decisions I, I i think it'd be crazy to believe that we have to have our lives dictated by what happens around us that's just not true circumstances will drive a thought thoughts drive emotions emotions will drive well incredibly acute emotions can drive compulsive decisions. So saying 
that guy made me angry, so I punched him, is not honest. Like, that guy got me thinking quickly, but he got me thinking. And that thought drove me to immediate anger. Most likely it's a trigger, but it drove me to anger. That anger doesn't feel safe enough. It's most likely covering fear. So let me think about something else that's even worse. Now we got real anger. Now we got rage. All right. Now I'm justified in my behavior of knocking this dude out. Right? There sure. is a, there is a pattern there. Now I'm not saying that some people don't deserve to get cold. Well, say there's some circumstances. I'm saying I, I mean, agree. Sometimes, dude, you know, I, I I'm not gonna be the judge. I'm I, not gonna. I be the do judge. feel like I understand and and under, what you're saying though of not being reactionary, mm -hmm. you know, responding and taking that moment to to really think about what it is that's happening, and maybe it is a trigger. The more that you were say responding with anger and that dark wolf is taking over, that's not gonna lead to a successful life. Right. You can't roll through your life responding to anger with everything. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to do it with one thing, it'll, I think I would assume it would be easier to do it with others. Yeah. And if you never jerk the reins on that guy, then you're going to respond in a, a more toxic manner sure. uh, with more interactions that you have, right? Yeah. So, and in getting that wolf under control, you're either under control or you're not. Mm -hmm. Or, or battling it out in some way. I felt that battle this morning. Same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was good. Yeah. It's like the. Uh... Just to stand in the water and shake my ass off. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> dude, I'm so glad. He's that still stopped. talking. I am so Fuck. glad. Oh, come on, dude. <laughs> just... We were talking. It was a dialogue. In case you didn't <laughs> notice, good. I talk a lot. Both me oh, and Michael. Good. We were. The Hawaiians have a joke. I remember when I was living out there, there's a joke. So I'm Portuguese descent. Okay. And so they say, oh, you Portuguese, you talk too much. <laughs> it's like the the running joke about Portuguese. Yeah. Portuguese. Can you speak Portuguese? A, a little bit. I, I, it's a I, hard language. It's hard enough, man. I used to when I was a kid, when I was really young, I could speak. But now if I get back in Portugal and I'm forced to speak it, give me like 45 minutes of a headache. And it's like breaks the starts rust off. Back. Like, yeah, it starts yeah. to. And it's enough to like... Communicate like a three-year-old, basically. Yeah. So I'm not going to say I'm fluent by no means. That's fair. Yeah. What's some of the gear that you're running? What do, what do you need to be a spear fisherman? What are the important pieces and how do you pick them? That's a good question, man. Um, I've got some free dive fins. They're like super long ones. Everyone mm -hmm. makes fun of me when we go to scuba diving places. Yeah. I like my fins. I, uh, yeah, they're big. I got made fun of for long blade fins <laughs> until I rescued two girls on my, um, I was on a, on my, my deep water yeah. certification scuba course. And uh, and I kind of was getting made fun of for having long blade fins. And then the instructor took us down current to begin with instead of up current. And like, I mean, the guy was great and everything, but I don't think anybody realized that how seems bad backwards. the current was. Yeah. It was backwards. Yeah. And by the end of it, these two girls were getting way up above the wreck and nobody else could kick them back. So I was helping to take these girls and drag them back up current. Wow. Because my long blade fins are freaking efficient. They're and awesome. I came up with more PSI in my tank than anybody else on that trip. Nice. Anyway, so long blade fins are important is what I'm saying. They're I very, like very them. efficient. Um, I would say the most important piece of kit, um, the brand that I use is all Rife International. Uh, Rife, I've been on the Rife team for several years now. and uh, But even before I was ever associated with them, I would use all Rife stuff. Um, they're made in America and... Just fantastic guns. Their suits are incredibly comfortable. Um, so yeah, I, I use all Rife gear. The uh, the wetsuit, I would say, um, my my mentor in freediving, he's the one that convinced me. His name is Martin Stepanek. He is the horse's mouth for all freediving education worldwide. End of story. He is the godfather of okay. freediving education. What was his name again? Martin Stepanek. Okay. Yep. The guy is 13 time world freediving record holder. And he's taken not just his expertise, but his gift for teaching and curriculum writing. He has standardized freediving curriculum and any other training agency that's been out there, whether they know it or not, their curriculum has at least primary elements that have come because Martin was connected to wires 
and stuff and being studied during his competitive career. And he wrote curriculum from this. So anyway, Martin told me one time that the most important piece of freediving gear is a good wetsuit. And he explained to me that a solid wetsuit, an open cell, uh, open cell neoprene wetsuit, it's essentially the neoprene's made by crushing limestone, I, I believe, or volcanic rock or something. But it's, it, there's That's no- how neoprene is made? It's this specific type of neoprene. So like oh. Yamamoto neoprene, for example, it's a neoprene that doesn't have any kind of linear, um, uh, any kind of linear stretch in one direction or another. So for example, a normal weave would be like a four-way stretch. You can stretch this way, this way, this way, this way. Um, versus Yamamoto open cell neoprene is unidirectional. It's a very malleable material. The part that's gonna be in contact with your skin, if it's dry, it's really sticky, it'll grip your skin. But we use essentially a, a lubricant so we use like water and and uh, hair conditioner, um, or there's this other stuff called shark snot that's uh, made from kelp, which doesn't mess my skin up as much. I have sensitive skin, but um, you use basically a, a lubricant. And man, when you put your wetsuit on, you've got goo coming out of your hands, your feet, your neck, your face is covered in goo. And what happens is your wetsuit then swims on top of your body. So I have complete mobility of my body. So now I'm not burning extra oxygen when I'm moving my body. Feeling constricted by yes. the tight suit. Yeah, right? and my breathing muscles are able to function right without fighting my suit. So a properly fitting suit hmm. gives you a tremendous amount of mobility and your oxygen consumption goes way down. Comfort goes way up. Um, it also gives you safety. So, uh, you know, if I... If I'm wearing a weight belt, I generally speaking, if I'm diving in water deeper than 30 feet or deeper than 33 feet, so that's 10 meters, 10 meters, um, I'm going to set my neutral buoyancy. So I'm neither floating nor sinking at about 33 feet. In order to do that, I need to have a wetsuit on to give me additional buoyancy. Because if I'm just diving in my board shorts, um, by the time I'm down at like 20 feet, my body is crushed enough to sink. Yeah. With 99% of all blackouts occurring at the surface or in the top 15 feet of water, statistically speaking, if you're in, if you're sinking at 10 feet, you are in that danger zone. So if you're coming up from a dive and you black out at the surface and your buddy's not there, you somehow get separated and you start sinking back down, where are you going to be when that terminal gasp kicks in if you black out? Wherever your buoyancy level's at, right? Well, you're going to go straight down to the bottom. If you're negatively buoyant at if you're 10 feet, yeah, yeah. let's say. You're going to keep sinking. Right. So yeah. if you black out below that or you expel air, now you're sinking way fast. So a, a wetsuit, what it does is it gives you buoyancy at the surface that you can then counteract with a weight belt to set a neutral buoyancy to safe place. So for example, if I'm diving in 10 feet of water, yeah, board shorts all day. But if I'm diving in deeper water, you try to offset your negative buoyancy with um, with positive buoyancy in a wetsuit and then tone it with, or Weights. tune it with the weights that you're gonna have. Most people dive with way too much weight. Really? Ever, yeah, most people, they think that, oh man, it's way easier when I'm strapped down with lead because my descent is so comfortable. It's like, well, yeah, but then you're swimming back up with a whole bunch of lead. And if you black out, you're going right back down. You just leave it at the bottom? I mean, if you, that's, weights are expensive, dude. You know, are they? Expensive. Yeah, if ammo's as expensive as it is, you bet the lead and freaking weight belts are oh, expensive shit. too. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, when in doubt, yeah, sure. I would way rather lose a weight belt than if I'm on a panicked end of a dive, which panic kills, but. So yeah, uh, I would say probably the wetsuit's the most important piece of gear. A good set of long blade fins. I use Divar, so Divar fins, and then Rife. Rife also um, has Divar fins in their lineup, uh, made by Divar. Uh, it's an Australian guy named Ray Powell, and he is an absolute nerd when it comes down to composites, how to use carbon, proper epoxy mi uh, mixes, proper vacuum pressures in the vacuum bagging process. Um, he is an absolute whiz kid, man. And he's one of the nicest, awesomest, awesomest. He is one of the nicest and most awesome guys I've ever met. He's he's another godfather in the free diving world, but his fins are phenomenal. Okay. So those are the fins that I use, long blade, um, long blade dive bars. 
Um, 85 centimeter is the length that I use. Medium to soft stiffness. What about spears and things? So um, rife guns are what I use. Um, Do you the reel the fish in? Do you just have them on the end of your spear? Oh, and good question, man. Um, so if I'm hunting like open water tuna or something like that, that are going to go straight down to the bottom, I'll use a breakaway system and a float. Okay. with a line with like bungee on it or something. So if I know this fish is about to dive and try to go down to a thousand feet, I better have something that's going to stop him because I don't have a thousand feet of line on yeah. this big old reel. So in that case, I would probably use a float and, and a line to where when I shoot it, the line comes loose from my gun. I hang onto my gun and then that fish goes and does what it wants to do. I let the float do the fighting and then eventually I hoist them back to the surface and kill them with my knife or a second shot with another gun. Um, most of the diving that I do, even with Wahoo, I use a real gun. So that's a gun with no float in line. Um, it's got a big reel with, uh, so the rife ones, there's a reel and then there's this Dyneema type of line. It's like 600 pound breaking strength. And, um, and so I'll have, you know, a few hundred feet of line on that reel to now when I take a shot, um, I pay out that line. I let the fish do its initial run while I'm making my way to the surface. And as that fish runs, they'll kind of explode. Some fish will do one hard run. Some will do two. Some just kind of start and they go until the very end. They never stop fighting. But either way, I let them do the run so that I can get to the surface holding my gun with the real line going. Um, when I feel like that initial fight is over, I'll tighten up the real line. Drag. Yeah, the drag on my reel, and then ditch my gun behind me and essentially hoist the line up while I'm swimming ahead. So getting tangled in line is a freaking killer. If you get tangled and that fish runs or a shark grabs your fish and drags you down and you're tangled up in your line, you've got a couple of seconds to cut yourself loose or you're in deep crap. So line management is so important mm. when you're dealing with any kind of um, fight with a fish underwater. So essentially, as I ditch my gun, I've now got this fish going down or out. And so as I'm, as I'm reeling this fish back in, it's kind of like climbing a rope. You're trying to leave, leave a straight line behind you and, uh, and you're basically creating tension, maintaining tension on that fish so that it, the spear doesn't um, toggle and come back out of the fish. So you're trying to maintain tension to wear them out. Um, and you're basically hoisting them up as you're swimming forward. So if you were to see it from below, you'd see the fish here, me here. And then as I'm working my way towards the fish, my gun would just trail behind me and I'm working my way to the fish as I hoist it up, leaving a straight line behind me so that I'm not getting tangled. Wow. Um, once I have the fish up, if I have to take a second shot, I'll have a buddy grab a, you know, let me take his gun and either I'll take the second shot or usually if you're working with a buddy, which you should be, just be like, dude, go take a second shot on it, plug it through the head, make sure that we got this fish and, uh, you know, take a second shot. Otherwise you get them up, in your hands, yeah, um, shaft in your hand, and then I will shove my hand up into its gills and get a hold of the gill rakers. Um, usually, most fish kind of go a little stiff when you grab them right there by the gills, and that gives you a good place of control to where knife comes out and you stab in the brain and and then end the fight and get them back to the boat. We've got your Instagram uh, up here, uh, but what is I think. That's a halibut? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's a halibut. And was that your record one? Or is that a different one? Okay, so here's the story. The record one was like 2018, I think. And that one still stands. It was two pounds heavier than that one in the photo. Oh, wow. But pretty I, I messed up. Yeah, I messed up a piece of paperwork. I sent in a video of the Waymaster saying the weight of the fish instead of a photo showing the weight of the fish and the fish not touching the ground, mm -hmm. which is what you need for the IUSA spearfishing records. Okay. So because I sent them a video, which clearly says 149.8 yeah. pounds, they docked me 10%. So right now the current world record is only like 137 point something or 134.7 or whatever. So that fish, which weighed 147 point something, was actually bigger than the current world record, but smaller 
than the actual fish that the world record's for. Wow. This is as dumb as that sounds. So anyway, but that fish actually fought me harder than uh, than that 149.8. That one was, that was the best fish in my life, man. Really? Oh, best fight I've ever had. And like, dude, I mean, I fought yellowfin, all sorts of different types. Of when you fish. say yellowfin, fought, like you're finning in the water while he's pulling and you have your hand wrapped into this line. I assume you're wearing gloves, right? Well, that one I wasn't because I was just taking photos. You see, I don't have gloves on. Like a yeah, freaking it's hard idiot. to tell. Well, you have chubby hands. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. <laughs> They're meaty. Yeah. yeah, meaty hands, I guess. <laughs> Short, yeah, definitely not piano hands or guitar <laughs> player hands. That's for sure. Um, no, on that photo, you can see that I don't have gloves on. Yeah. And the reason for it is because that fish came up to the boat right as I was putting my camera back onto the boat. I was just taking photos of my buddy, Brad. He had, shot a, he had shot a fish. So I was in the water taking photos and having seven mil gloves on, trying to take photos and control buttons, they just don't go well together. So I yeah. take my gloves off, got my camera, I'm taking photos. And one of the guys up on the deck sees this huge fish come up right next to the boat. I think it was chasing up his lure or something. And he's like, big fish. And everybody but me and Brad were in the water. His gun was unloaded because he's we were taking photos. He's putting his fish back up there. So I'm like, grab my gun, take my camera. So they give me my gun. Brad is in the water with me. He's quickly reloading. I've already got a loaded gun. I quickly load it and uh, did a dive down to the bottom. And then that's when I saw that one and engaged in a fight to the death. Yeah, that's gnarly, man. But yeah, that one absolutely brutalized me, dude. Am I supposed to tell the story about it now? Yeah, if you want to. Uh, whatever you got. Yeah, I don't I don't, right. ha, I don't see the clock, so I don't know where we're at. <laughs> whatever. Pull a Joe Rogan. <laughs> just just go until the cows come home. Um so how do you feel about aliens? <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel like how do you feel about aliens on psilocybin? <laughs> It'd probably be something. It's the only like time that. I meet them. Yeah. I, I don't want that in the thing. <laughs> I don't want my kids to hear that. All how right. many kids do you have? I got two. Yeah. Yeah. How's that? I have mean? a son. He's seven. Daughter. She's five. And a baby on the way. Dude, good for you. Dude. When you got, she do? You got kids? Yeah. I have a boy who's five and a baby on the way. Right on, dude. Yeah. I just found out. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Isn't that isn't that wild, dude? Like you think life is three dimensional? Yeah. Till those kids come along. Oh man. It's like. Oh whoa! I was living in. I was living on flat paper before this. This is so weird. Yeah. Oh so man. It, it's a life change. turns out don't move into your new house on the night your wife is ovulating. That's a thing. Um, so yeah, we're due in August. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that one to the bank, dude. <laughs> yeah. 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 Consider my... yourself warned. <laughs> <laughs> our, uh, our first was conceived on a mountain in the Azores. Oh, wow. My wife and I were like, we had just gotten married and we were visiting some friends there spearfishing in the Azores. Wow. That's and so cool. he let us stay in this like little house that was right up there. And it was like this stormy day, dude. And like, you know, it's on like the edge of Pico, the volcano. And it was just like this cozy day. Anyway, we were able to track it back to uh, things that happened in that nice little place on that yeah, little yeah. island. Bad weather days in a pretty place. Yeah. That's what happens. So now I have a son. That's all. Awesome. Seven years old. It's a fun age. It is. Yeah, it is. It's challenging, man. Like they start at that age, dude, they start like realizing like, wait a minute, I've got the freedom to do anything I want. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yes, you do. You can choose right and you can choose wrong. Right. The choice is yours. Right. And just because you're choosing what you want doesn't mean that you don't have choice when you choose what we ask you to do. Mm. And that's going to be a lesson that I'm starting to think is going to be a long drawn out one that very well might take a while. So I'm, I'm very much the type, like when you give me the rules, I need to know why. Really? I didn't notice if, that if this morning in yeah, the pool or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That wasn't made blunt. I was like, so apparent this morning. what's the, pro what's the real problem here? We can't walk with a weight <laughs> in water because we just shouldn't hold our breath in the water. That's Okay. So what's the real problem? Yeah. There? And that's you're telling me there's a stove on fire and I can't put my hand on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how my kid is a, a thousand percent. 
Yeah. And so, and I brutal like, irony when I'm, I remember when he was like four, when I'm 18, I'll do whatever I want. I was like the hell you will. When you leave my roof, you go to the police and a judge. And if I don't teach you how to behave <laughs> in the world, they will. And trust me, they don't love you. Yeah. And it's like, that's sound advice. That dude. is my job on this planet. Yeah. Like, there's not another man in the world that wants you to be better than him, but me mm -hmm. like, but it, it is like, and, you know, I remember my parents giving me advice and me thinking, fuck, I ain't doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you know, and I, mm -hmm. and I could see it in his face too. And I'm like, I wouldn't jump off that. It's like, what do you know, old man? Like, Dude, that's I'll jump hilarious. off anything. <laughs> man, I was, I think I was, so I was the oldest. And by the time I started realizing that bad behavior was bad behavior, um, it was my brother that seemed to be the one that was always getting into trouble. Mm. So like, I felt this like crazy need to, to like be the peacemaker because yeah. I remember my brother getting it more than I did. And my brother remembers me getting it more than he did. So maybe he had a different perspective. Yeah. I don't know, but uh, yeah, man, I, I just remember like, oh my gosh, like I don't, I don't want to disobey because then this is going to happen. And you know, anyway, so Michael on the other hand was, he was fly by the seat of his pants and just like ha had to figure things out on his own, which oh, yeah. that was, that was a tough one. So like I, I would learn from some of his mistakes, but conversely, I also learned so much from him on, and, and I was thankful that he was the way that he was. Cause you know, he helped me to override so many of my fears, you know, at his young age, like we paddled out to this freaking bridge and jumped off of it together. And of course he was the first one to go. There's like cars honking and stuff. And it's like 70 feet up. Damn. And we do this like, do this jump. I think I was like 11 or 12 and he was 10. 70 feet. Yeah, it was That's something legit. like that. Yeah. I, it was something like that. It was big. Either way, I remember counting one, two, bang, and we hit the water. Like it was a long fall. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, was, it went real, real dark, real fast. <laughs> Hell yeah. That nasty water. But yeah, no, my, I mean, it's it's just different, dude. I, I really believe kids have to be disciplined and taught to where they're at and who they are. Yeah. You can't, you can't discipline one kid the way that you discipline the other because- Yeah, I mean, I've often they're different felt souls, man. When they're like, I raised all my kids the same. And it's like, well, maybe you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that, I raised kids the way that I was raised. That wasn't the best strategy because they're not the same person. Agreed. Yeah. Yep. What have been your main fathering challenges? Me dealing with my own shit. Bro. Thousand percent. Uh, you, you, like you, you it is more picking up what I'm putting self, down on the Oh, dude, yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so crazy. Like you think you've got a handle on who you are and and the way you're going to respond to things, yeah. and then when those kids come out, it's all the energy you put in to just kind of navigating where your head would go. Be like, oh man, I'm having a rough day. I'm gonna go and do this, or I'm gonna do that. You don't have energy or time to do those like salves anymore. And so when the kids come along, it's like, dude, it's right in your face yeah. and there's nowhere to go. Yeah, There's nowhere to go and there's no excuses. You're out of time and you're out of energy. Now what are you gonna do? And so I think the most challenging thing has been for me and my wife to both recognize the fact that, whoa, I'm not as collected as I thought that I was. Mm. I am going to talk to somebody about this, do some work on myself, and then we're gonna bring it back to the table and realize like when my wife and I are butting heads, it's probably my old shit butting heads with her old shit, hmm. not us actually butting heads. And if we don't know that, our marriage is going to really suffer. Yeah. And so like her doing her personal work, you know, I mean, I can't say enough about finding a good therapist, but finding a, a solid therapist that knows a solid path for you to take. Uh, you know, EMDR has got tremendous potential and, and good therapy and there's talk, talk therapy and learning how to deal with, okay, uh, right now I'm experiencing a fight response. Here's a way to be able to off gas that energy and put it into something else and identify it and so on. Dude, my wife and I both working on our own way and we've got a long way to go. Like I still wanna do more work. Even well, if it's a problem that you don't ever solve. 
Yeah, it's a you lifelong manage pursuit. It, yeah, right? yeah, there's problems you solve pursuit. and there's problems you manage. And your own bullshit and your own self growth, those aren't saying things that you solve one day. It's something yeah. you're going to have to manage because one of the biggest things I've learned with having kids is like, there's not a point that you figure it out. <laughs> and that's where Amen I was really that, confused dude. because yeah. I'm like, oh, we got okay. I've got an infant now. I, we gotta we gotta feed her every two feed him every two hours. I gotta make sure there's you know a clean diaper and don't let him fall because we got concrete floors. Okay. Yeah. And and once I feel like okay, I I've figured that out. Then he he now is crawling and it, like it's just constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. The moment I think I've got something and there's like a trend and a pattern, like oh I think I got it. This is gonna make him sleep through the night. There is no right. pattern. <laughs> there's not one. It just changes yeah. again. Mm -hmm. Or they or they get older and they're their development has grown into a, a new world of sports now. Mm -hmm. So now we have all these problems with sports, you know, coaches, other kids. Uh, do they even, I don't want to go to practice today. Yeah. Okay. Now is I got to coach him through being acceptable. a like, lazy ass, right? Yeah. Like this is hard or I'm not good at this or like mm -hmm. self-confidence. You you're trying to figure that out and you're looking around and you're like, all these other parents don't know what the hell they're doing either. <laughs> like this, this coach is some volunteer parent that just told my kid he's terrible and he sucks and my, he's five and he played his first game. Like, how am I navigating this with this dude that now? It might be one of those times you punch somebody in dude, the face. Yeah, we got pretty no, upset I'm about it. I'm not advocating well, for that. We, you know, we weren't it, sure how to handle it because it was their first football game. It's flag they're five. Oh, I would have lost my mind. And he's like, y'all played horrible today. This is the worst football I've ever seen. And I'm looking around like, I didn't know that that was on the spectrum of, of at five, at five, like horrible. Like where are we freaking? They don't like, even North know Korea the place. right now. Like it's like North Korea, and you didn't twirl your rifle the right way. Like where, where did this? Yeah, come I mean, from? like half the team wanted to quit. And I bet. Three, I'm like, yeah, kids don't want to do this. And so now he's like, I'll play next year if you'll coach. I'm like, fuck, I don't know how to coach football. Like, you know, I ended up coaching T-ball, never played it in my life. I, I don't think you need to. You probably don't need to at no, that age, No, my kids right? did T-ball too. And it was seriously just every kid gets to hit the ball. <laughs> And then they just kind of run around in the field and everybody has a great time. You know what they loved the most was red light, green light. We'd play it from okay. home base to first. And every time I'd say red light, I'd make them do push-ups. And they loved it. <laughs> they thought it was the greatest thing. That's right. That's what I'm saying, dude. Like kids will have time to be able to. Anyways, I, I get what you're saying. Every yeah. freaking kid needs to be raised the way that they need to personally be raised. And I think it, it takes a tremendous amount of intention mm. and time. I, I I don't believe that quality time will ever replace quantity time. I think quantity time is quality time and quality time should have time there, you know? I mean, it's when you're around, it's crazy how many little transition times, like the longer you're with them, the more you realize, whoa, that was, that was a moment of growth. Like, yeah. You know, and then there's for all those moments that you think are moments of growth, there's a hundred more that you didn't even know you were teaching yeah. the child. Like I, I, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm thankful that I was blessed with the opportunity to be given these souls under my care. Mm. But boy, you want to feel inadequate? Become a parent. It's humbling. It's the hardest, most sucky, horrible thing in the world, and it's the best most fulfilling, most purpose-driven and important thing, and did I already say meaningful thing, available to yeah. the human condition. Nothing will ever compare to it. Yeah. And I will also say, no one's ever ready to have kids. <laughs> I don't care how much you got in the bank, yeah. how nice the house is, or how big your minivan is, you're never ready to have kids. So you're always ready to have kids. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, like that. Let's not generalize that one too much. That's a bit of overgeneralization right there. Is there anything that you use to gauge your relationship with your son to hmm. determine if like there are times, multiple times I can I can think that like he stopped coming to me. Hmm. Or it's like, dad's gonna go to go to town. Do you want to go with him? No. You know, dad's going to the farm. Do you want to go help him? No. Where I'm like, okay, I've been gone. We've been button heads. Like we need a day, mm -hmm. just me and him. 
And I'll be like, you want to go to Austin Parks and Pizza and like bribe him with fun? And he's like, yeah, sure. Okay. And so then we we go and we get that time. And I'm like, whatever today brings, whatever he wants to do, within reason, um, <laughs> I'm going to do that thing. And mm-hmm. this is just just for him. Like, we need that connection. Is there anything that you do like that to to uh, keep that that feeling with them? Yeah. Um I notice I notice that there's times where I feel myself pulling away because I feel uncomfortable with the level of affection that he gives me. So like there's times where I have to check back in and make sure that I'm there all the way because when 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 I've got the stress of finances or whatever or my own stuff going on or my own sadness or like the desperation I was talking about, it's just so easy to believe you're the only thing that exists. Yeah. You don't even realize it, but you know, you're bringing that home and you know, when I'm, when I'm attentive about it, I'll take a moment and kind of decompress before I step into the home to make sure that I can meet them at the emotional state that they're at. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Hey guys, like good to see ya. Instead of just like, Hey, you know, (laughs) and, and then there's times where like my son will get up and he will try to lock eyes with me. And he'll like rub my face and it's just like there and shows so much love and admiration. And and I've noticed that like when, when I'm willing to accept the fact that I am good enough to be his father, I let myself make eye contact with him. Hmm. I let myself be shown affection and I reciprocate right dealing with your own shit exactly yeah no that's exactly what it is one of the most common things believe it or not when i'm doing wolf walk um one of the most common ones is my kids will pop into my head and i use them as a form of uh, of like forward thinking right like oh you know my kids love me and it's this this great place that keeps me in a solid headspace dark wolf will take that be like yeah but you're never going to be a good enough dad those kids deserve better than you. That's where my freaking head goes. And it drives shame and remorse and sadness and all sorts of stuff. So I'm able to recognize that like I have a sensitivity and a weakness to feeling inadequate as a father. And I can say with certainty that that's not logical. Why? Because I know that it showed up when that nasty old animal brain was going. And so it takes like, it takes reminding myself of that. Oftentimes we're like, dude, look at your treasure of a son looking at you right now, or your, your daughter, look at this admiration they have. Like they look at you as the greatest thing ever. Daddy, I love you so much. Daddy, you're the greatest, you know? And it's maybe I look at him like you little idiot. Like (laughs) Like, if you knew how dumb I was, you wouldn't look at me that way. (laughs) No, I, and I, I think I think <laughs> it's easier for me to believe what they tell me. And I think kind of coming back to your question, is that sense of connection and reconnecting? Yeah. Is I've got to check my own self degradation, my down talking to be able to believe my child. And when I do, that brings us close. Yeah. So that you're able to accept it. Right? Yeah. To accept their love. Instead, yeah. Instead of me going and living on my iceberg in the middle of nowhere, mentally, was your I'm, dad very detached? Did you feel no? Close to no. Him? I mean, so my dad was an Angolan refugee, dude. You know, really? he had all he had lots of his own experiences at a really important age. He was seventeen, heard his girlfriend shot and killed. I mean, his friend's house got mortared during the civil war in in Angola. We're Portuguese descent, and so, you know him and all of his siblings, they've got their way that they've dealt with that. And some of that cultural, I'm sure. Too. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of cultural, but I was, I was fortunate that, you know, my dad was a very passionate man and um, passionate in the sense that like, dude, you needed to obey. There's no two ways about it. You must obey. Mm. And um, then on the other side was, he, I remember so many times, like he wanted us in the garage building stuff with him, creating, going windsurfing together, going surfing together. So it was always like activities together. And at the end of the day, it's like every night, you know, go up, give each other a kiss in the cheek and off to bed kind of thing. So there was like plenty of physical affection, like hugs and all that kind of thing growing up. 
I'm super thankful for that because, you know, I'm able to show that with my kids and I'm mm -hmm. incredibly thankful for that, like snuggle time and all that kind of thing. Yeah, It's really only like when my head is running amok and I feel less than, shame is beating me up. I feel like not good enough, not gonna be a good enough dad. I should be more patient. I should be more kind. Like, man, I'm a piece of shit. Like these kids deserve better. When that those type of thoughts come in, it's not them pulling away from me. It's me like being present, but not being present. And so when I'm able to check back in, that really helps out. But coming back to what you were saying, like I hate calling it a daddy son date. I think date is probably yeah, the wrong I word. Have used an that outing, word. <laughs> an <laughs> outing. I mean, daddy daughter date sounds a hell of a lot I just lot say better. like, we need a day. Like there we need go. a day to there get, go. be together and yeah. go do something cool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah. No, exactly, man. No, Father, I, son, date. <laughs> yeah, no. 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 We're not in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> it's Austin. Oh, man. It's getting close to that, but not quite Portland. I, I appreciate you sharing and opening no, up I'm, with us, I'm man. glad we went there. I think that you've, you've honored your brother's memory very well. And I hope people hearing this can use it and maybe try it one day, maybe link up with you, take a class, take some training and uh, fight whatever dark wolf they have in their world. You, you give a shout out. You've got it right there. I breathe water. On, sure. What are your other platform? Where can people find you? Um, yeah, I'm, I would just say Instagram is probably the easiest. Um, website right now is a work in progress um i'm hoping to have a book published this week this uh this year nice um gonna try to get that out there right now the title of it is light wolf dark wolf but that'll probably change along with all the chapter headings and yeah. that kind of deal but oh, yeah. um that that really dives into a lot of stuff with my upbringing and and it, it's i think it's going to be exactly what i need to leave behind awesome. is this book so be watching for that here in this uh this year 2024 and then my instagram is i breathe water it's pretentious i know but i've had it for like over a decade and i'm not yeah. changing it now so yeah, i don't a lot actually i'm in the water it works i do but to say you breathe water just sounds pretentious but anyway that's my instagram i will handle. say what i read i was like no you don't <laughs> <laughs> no <Water>. no <laughs> like yeah i do watch this <laughs> yeah so i breathe water on instagram um you know, I, I respond to pretty much anybody that reaches out and um, challenge accepted. No <laughs> oh, crap. Here we go. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm really stoked. We got a chat. I'm, I'm pumped. We're going to talk a little bit about daddyhood and yeah. all that good stuff. So, uh, hope everybody gets something from it and thanks for having me.